Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about the nearness of the kingdom. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Send links out to everyone you know. Let's get them involved. Let's get them watching our online service. All right. I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. So as I record this, this is the first day of summer. And I don't know about you, but I absolutely love summer. And it's just, it, it's my favorite time of the year. Uh, some people love winter, some people love fall. There's just something about summer that brings back so many, I guess for me, a lot of youthful memories. Uh, one of the fondest memories I ever had growing up was going up north near Ludington, Michigan, camping. And I can remember times swimming with my, my cousins and my brother and, and, and there was a pop stand and there was a snack bar and there was, you know, we could buy candy and pop and all that kind of stuff. And we would, you know, roast uh, marshmallows at night and just, we did, it was just a lot of fun. And, and I just remember that every single summer, especially when we get close to the 4th of July, which is about the time we go camping and every, anytime I smell a campfire, it just evokes memories they come back. And you know, you think about summer, you think about maybe going out swimming or, or going boating or going water skiing or laying out in the sun or playing baseball or watching a baseball game or being on vacation or just being outside and, and watching the stars at night and, and feeling a, you know, a soft summer breeze at night, not having to wear a jacket. There's just something really special about summer that I, I love. And if you, you know, as we're talking about the kingdom of God in this section of the Gospel of Mark, when we, we think about summer, it really um, is kind of a preview of, of coming, you know, uh, attractions. Because the Bible describes the kingdom of heaven as a, as a banquet, a, a homecoming, a joyful reunion, a Sabbath, a full and final reprieve from life's misery, drudgery, and loss. Uh, if you will, the kingdom of God is endless summer. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 that a new heavens and a new earth is coming where there is no more sorrow and there's no more pain and there's no more sickness and there's no more getting old and there's no more being overweight and there's no more, you know, uh, uh, suffering the loss of loved ones. I mean, it's just an incredible, incredible experience. And, uh, you know, if, if you will... Uh, summer is bestowing, uh, is, is God's bestowal of a sense of the kingdom, is, is that we get kind of a foretaste in the time of summer of what it's going to be like in all of eternity. It's incredible. And so as we look in the scriptures in Mark's gospel, uh, the 14th, I'm sorry, the first chapter in the 14th and 15th verse, we see Jesus coming and we see Jesus announcing the gospel, which is the good news. What's the good news? The kingdom of God is coming. And again, you've got to capture this idea of an endless summer. You know, a time of incredible joy and bliss and, and lightheartedness um, and, and freedom from worry and freedom from care. Think of, you know, a, a great summer vacation. That's, that's kind of a glimpse of the kingdom of God. So it really is 
good news. And we're going to talk about it a little more fully this morning. So let's read the scripture here in Mark's uh, gospel, the first chapter, verses 14 and 15. It says that after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And so Jesus said that the kingdom of God is near. And, and, and there's a kingdom that, that, that is coming with his arrival. But here's the challenge as we think of the kingdom. We think of God's rule on this earth. We think of the, the complete removal of sin and, and, and the devil and demonic oppression and sickness and sorrow and pain and worry and fear and man's inhumanity to man. Okay, what does that exactly mean? Because Jesus said it was near 2,000 years ago. And as we look at this, it's important for us to recognize that the church traditionally over the last 2,000 years, have actually had five different ways of looking at and perceiving what Jesus said when he said, the kingdom of God is near. So I want to talk about that uh, this morning, okay? And, and so when we understand the kingdom, the kingdom is kind of what we would call a shalom moment, okay? A moment where something new is taking place, that God is renewing sinful humanity and creation, that, that God has come to offer power, to the human race for spiritual, moral, and bodily redemption. So it really is good news. But traditionally, again, five different views of what the kingdom is all about. The first view, and this was the view of the first century uh, Jewish Christians, is that the kingdom of God was going to be purely political. In other words, the Jewish people were chafing under the brutal rule of their Roman overlords. And so much as, if you will, Donald Trump, uh, when he ran for, for president, you know, his slogan was, Make America Great Again. If you want to think of the kingdom of God coming in a, spirit, in, you know, in a political way, it would be like, Make Israel Great Again. Is that Israel had been under the thumb of the Romans for hundreds of years. And so they wanted to kind of get, get, throw that yoke off and achieve their own political rule so the Roman overlords were not bringing idolatry into Ju you know, Judaism and, and all those types of things. They didn't want any of that. And so they wanted, so, so when, they heard, when they heard Jesus say, the kingdom is near, they're thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to be delivered from this Roman rule. We're going to have a, a form of political deliverance in the form of the Davidic you know, Messiah that has come. But of course, that didn't happen. Right? At least not in the way they thought. A second viewpoint of the idea of the kingdom of God is near is that we've reached the end of history. That there's like a final judgment and an end of history that is occurring. In other words, they thought that judgment was immediate and was going to come right then and there. Now, how did they get that? Where did they get these ideas from? Well, if you look at Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God coming with power. And so when Jesus made statements like that, people thought in the first century for sure that the kingdom was coming right then and there and that God was going to judge all of the wickedness of the world. All right, A third interpretation of the kingdom of God is near is what theologians call realized eschatology. And that's this idea that the God's promised rule is coming now. The kingdom is coming right now. Now, okay, now why did they think that? Well, there's a couple of things that Jesus said that led them to this conclusion. If you look at Luke's gospel, Luke 11, verse 20, Jesus said this, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the, thing, then the kingdom of God has now come to you. And in Matthew 13, verse 16 and 17, Jesus said this, But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth that many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but do not hear it. So it's this idea of the, of the kingdom of God coming right now. And even in our day and age, there is a kingdom now theology, in particular within charismatic circles. And you'll see this in the New Apostolic Movement, uh, if you're familiar with that. This idea that we can usher in the kingdom of God and become the, the revealed sons of God now 
and we can take dominion over the world now for God, okay, before Jesus returns, okay, which is, a, which is an aberrant uh, strain of eschatology. But, but it's similar to this idea that the kingdom of God is going to come right away. Now, these three interpretations, okay, we, we can see fairly clearly at least I can see them very clearly, that, that they're not accurate, right? That, that, that's not exact, that's not what happened, that's not what Jesus meant when he said the kingdom of God is near. But the next two that we're going to talk about probably hit closer to home for many of us, okay? The fourth interpretation of Jesus said, hey, the kingdom of God is near, repent. And the nearness of the kingdom meant merely a spiritual kingdom. Is that what Jesus came to bring was something merely spiritual only. Okay? And, and we understand this as evangelical Christians when we say, well, you need to be born again. And what does it mean to be born again? It means to accept Jesus into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. And so by doing that, we receive Jesus. He forgives us of our sins. He comes and takes residence in our heart through the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Does that really happen? Absolutely it happens. But the problem with this is we privatize and we miniaturize the kingdom as something that happens personally, something that's merely subjective, something that only I experience myself, and it has no wider ramifications for the wider world. And so what that leads people to think is the kingdom of God is just a spiritual thing. It's just something I experience in my own life. It's something I experience when I worship God on my own, or it's something I experience even at church in a corporate setting where I sense the presence of God, but it's merely a spiritual thing. It's a subjective thing, and it has no application for the wider world. So when we talk about things like law and politics and business and media and technology and science and all these types of things, Christianity and, and, and the things of God and the kingdom of God doesn't apply to all of that. It just applies to me and my, it, it just applies to me and Jesus. It just applies to, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've asked him into my heart. I've asked him into my life. Okay, that is another view that is, well, I can say this candidly, probably pretty prevalent among many Christians. That they think that that's what the kingdom means. Just merely a spiritual dynamic or a spiritual component that individuals experience themselves when they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then the fifth view is what they call the already and the not yet view of the kingdom. Okay, This view, let me tell you, is the accurate view. Okay, In other words, it's this idea that, that the God's kingdom has come. The rule of God has come. The dynamic rule of God has come in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, But it's not fully come. It has come in the sense that, yes, we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior individually, but it means more than that. It means so much more than that. It's not merely I ask Jesus into my life, but it is Jesus inviting us into his life. And so the kingdom, the rule of God, involves the manifestation of the kingdom throughout the earth. Not just individually in my heart, but, well, we see it in the Gospels, right? People being physically healed, right? People, be, people having demons <laughs> cast out of them. Jesus walking on water, commanding the waves, the sea, the storm to, you know, to be still, right? Is that a manifestation of the kingdom of God on this, on this earth? Absolutely. The cross of Jesus, his death and resurrection, was that a manifestation of the kingdom far beyond something internally spiritual? Spiritual? Absolutely it is. Okay? And, and, and that's the kingdom now. Okay? But it's, it's the already, it's the manifestation of it now, and we as followers of Jesus can pray for the sick and we can see them recover. And we as followers of Jesus can lead people to Jesus and that they would accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they would also, uh, you know, walk in the kingdom of God now. We can help people experience miracles, the presence of God, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit on this earth, and yet the fullness of God's redemption of all creation, the fullness of God's redemption of, of the human body is for the not yet. It, it, it's when Jesus comes and returns, and we have a new heavens and a new earth. So this idea of the kingdom near, the kingdom of God is near, is something that's happening now, 
but its fullness is for the future. Again, if you read Revelation 21 and 22, you'll read all about a new heavens and a new earth, all right? And it's coming. And so, in other words, there's going to be no more sorrow. There is going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more disease. Is that animals, the ferocity of animals is going to change to where, you know, little children can play with snakes. They can, they can play with lions. In other words, all of this, all of the effects of sin and its curse is going to be completely removed, but not yet. That's what Jesus was talking about. Now, this is important for us to understand because, again, Jesus never said that the kingdom of God is merely spiritual. Okay, he didn't say it's just something within the human heart. And see, the problem with that is that, again, it leads to the privatization of the gospel. It leads to people thinking that Christianity, Christians think this, and people in the world think this. That, hey, your Christian faith is just a hobby. Do it on Sundays, but don't you dare bring it into the workforce. Don't you dare bring it into the office on Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Don't you dare bring Jesus into the courtroom. Don't you dare bring Jesus into the public schools or into the law courts, or something like that, right? Is that, again, if, if the kingdom of God is something merely spiritual, we can kind of cordon off Christians and Christianity and its impact into a private subjective sphere that has no wider relevance for the rest of the world. And see, the issue is this. It's not the kingdom that enters the believer, but it's the believer that enters into Christ's kingdom through repentance and submitting into the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom of God is much bigger than we realize. Or let me say it another way. Jesus didn't come to save us from being human. Jesus saved us so that we would be fully human again. Let me say that again because that's really good. That's from a book called A Practical Guide to Culture by John Stone Street and Brett Kunkel. Christ didn't save us from being human. He saved us so that we would be fully human again. So this is this idea of, yes, receiving Jesus as your Lord, but you are, <laughs> you're walking into his kingdom. Jesus invites you into his kingdom. Jesus invites you into what it means to be human fully in right relationship with God, loving God with all your heart, but loving other people, having your heart changed so that you can be fully human again. Again, this idea is captured really, really well in the book Evangelical is Not Enough by Thomas Howard. I love this. This captures this idea of, of entering into Christ's kingdom. Okay, It says this. It says, The incarnation takes all that properly belongs to our humanity and delivers it back to us redeemed. All of our inclinations and appetites and capacities and yearnings and proclivities are purified and gathered up and glorified by Christ. He did not come to thin out human life. He came to set it free. All the dancing and feasting and processing and singing and building and sculpting and baking and merrymaking that belong to us and that were stolen away into the service of false gods are returned to us in the gospel. That, my friends is what the kingdom of God is near means. Yes, there's a coming kingdom, right? Where God's going to make everything new and he's going to make all the wrongs right and all the injustices, uh, you know, is going to be rectified. But right now, we can enter into that kingdom and we can be fully human, serving God in our vocation, serving God as moms and dads and, and you know, as, as baseball coaches and engineers and, and, and co-workers in whatever capacity and sphere you're in, bringing that kingdom with us wherever we go. Time doesn't permit me to talk about the influence of Christianity on the Western world, our system of justice, our system of rights, our system of dignity, our system of toleration, our love towards others, our care for the marginalized, all of that came about. All of that are the fruits of the Christian worldview. They're the fruits of the kingdom of God manifesting itself on this earth. The, the, the blessings of liberty are ours because of Jesus. So as I close, all of this begs a question for all of us. Because again, <laughs> summer is a foretaste of the kingdom. If you're loving summer and you're loving the freedom of summer and all the blessings that are around us in the summertime, all of the life and the fruitfulness that's going on, it's a foretaste of the kingdom. A great question for me 
And a great question for you in light of this is, since the kingdom of God is near, how much of it have you experienced? If Jesus invites us into his kingdom, says, come on, come on into the kingdom, how far have you gone? A couple feet? A hundred feet? Several miles? Right? What is, in other words, what is keeping you from going all out for God? What is keeping you from going full out into the kingdom of God? Expecting miracles, expecting breakthroughs, expecting healings, expecting God to move in the political sphere and in the legal sphere and in the educational sphere and in the technological sphere. And I can go on and on and on. In other words, if, it's truly, if the kingdom of God is truly here, we should be walking in it and we should be bringing it with us wherever we go. That's my, that, that's my prayer for my life and that's my prayer for your life. As I close with this scripture. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 in the message paraphrase. And I ask him that with feet, with both feet planted firmly in love, you'll be able to take in with all Christians the, extra, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb its depths. Rise to its heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. Jesus said, listen, repent for the kingdom of God is near. The apostle Paul says, hey, in light of that, why don't you explore it? Why don't you go into it more deeply? Why don't you bring the kingdom into your marriage more fully? Why don't you bring the kingdom into your parenting more fully? Why don't you bring the kingdom and Christ's rule where you work, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your grocery store, whatever you're doing, let the kingdom of God come. Let God's will be done. Enter into that kingdom and bring others along with you into that kingdom. That's the word of the Lord for today. That's what we're talking about when Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word and the idea of the kingdom of God as endless summer and all of the joys and incredible memories that maybe many of us have about summer. That's just a foretaste. That's just a glimpse of what God has for us in the kingdom. And so God, my prayer for all of us is that we would enter the kingdom more fully. We would explore it more fully. We would bring Christ's rule and reign, not just in our hearts and allow it to, to rule and reign in our hearts, but God, we would bring it into our homes, our families, our marriages, where we work, whatever we do. God, I pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this now, and I pray a blessing over all your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it was great to be with you. And until next week, I call you blessed.